Okay, this is Michael from Blue Sky Bio. I'd like to welcome everybody who's joining and watching today's webinar presentation. If you have questions during the webinar presentation, please enter them into the QA box on the right side of your screen. Please make sure to complete your details in the webinar attendance form. There are links to the webinar attendance form in the comments section under the viewing screen. Please enter your details so we can send you the CE credit for the webinar presentation. Uh, worried about recent updates in the Blue Sky Plan treatment planning software. If you haven't yet downloaded or recently downloaded the software, please go ahead and download the latest version from our website at blueskyplan.com. We have integrated an automatic nerve detection. We've integrated automatic intelligent panoramic curve, other great functionalities such as advanced tooth extraction and different operational modes for different users using the software. So all of that, you can download the software from blueskyplan.com. For today's webinar presentation, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Jerome Haber, the founder of Guided Surgery Solutions. He's going to be discussing tips to make your guided surgery case a smashing success, including the use of the thin layer, thin layer guide system. Dr. Haber? Michael, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank you for hosting this webinar, and I also want to offer my compliments on what a wonderful job you have done in developing this software. The Blue Sky Plan software is incredibly powerful, easy to use, and, and again, compliments on a job well done. Thank you. Um, as Michael has said, I'm co-founder and part owner of Guided Surgery Solutions, and we manufacture CT-based implant drill guides. Um, our guides are different from the printed guides that you may have commonly seen and um, we offer both a tubeless guide and a tube guide for reasons that I will explain a little bit in this presentation. We also make custom disposable drill stops so that if your drills are long enough you can use your own drills um, with these guides and you do not need a guided surgery kit. Um, this discussion tonight is probably a little different from any um, guided surgery talk that I've given before. I really want to talk about um, the nitty-gritty little details that people don't seem to describe that actually make or break your success in doing guided surgery. I think um, as someone involved in a company trying to promote guided surgery, we're swimming against the tide a little bit because I think there are so many misconceptions about guided surgery and there are perhaps um, many many people who've tried guided surgery who have had bad experiences um, in fact because of the way guided surgery has been framed and perhaps um, the expectations that have been set for guided surgery as it's been commercialized in the last 20 years so um, so I'd like to start off this talk by setting expectations and let's talk about what is guided surgery is it bulletproof is there any error in guided surgery are all drill guides created equal is guided surgery flapless surgery is guided surgery a method that enables inexperienced surgery to do implant in, inexperienced surgeons to do implant surgery and is there much of a learning curve to become a competent guided surgery surgeon so I'd like you to kind of tuck this, these questions in the back of your mind as we begin our discussion. Well, what is guided surgery? I think as everyone here knows, it is a technology that uses 3D imaging and planning software and it allows the surgeon to plan and perform implant surgery virtually with full visibility of all relevant anatomy. From these data, a drill guide is used to transfer these implant positions to the patient and facilitate the placement of implants and the key thing is you're able to do it in restoratively and surgically optimal positions without violating critical anatomical structures. That's what guided surgery is. And how is it implemented? Well, we know that we obtain 3D data to use to virtually represent the jaw. And then using software, we determine the ideal implant positions. And then the guide is manufactured, placed on the patient's jaw. And then we drill into the jaw to create our osteotomies. Conceptually, that's what we do. Um, when you look at the digital workflow, you um, 
you know, you get a cone beam scan or a CAT scan, you diagnosis, there's planning, you merge your data, you manufacture your guide, and then you use your guide. And I think the first thing I'd like to highlight for all of you is that there's error in every single one of these steps. And just like every other technique used in dentistry, if you think back to of all the error involved in fabricating a gold crown, uh, cutting a prep, taking an impression, pouring a stone model, investing, waxing, burning it out, casting, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, there's quite a bit of error in, this, in all the different steps in making a crown, and yet, in the end, we're able to make a gold crown that fits very nicely. And guided surgery is very much like that. There's error in every step of the process, and you have to be very meticulous and it's technique sensitive, but yet if you know what you're doing, in the end, it's a very, ni very, very nice technique. It's the safest, most accurate way we have of placing implants. And again, I think I'd like to also ask you to tuck this back in the back of your mind as you set expectations and think about what guided surgery is and how you use it. And I, I think this is a valid statement for us doing uh, implant surgery. It is, import, it is as important to know what a technology cannot do as it is to know what it can do. And I think that's something that's really, really important because I think we tend to emphasize what it can do um, and we don't pay so much attention to what it cannot do. Now, let's get down to the nitty gritty a little bit. What are the variables, variables that determine success or failure in guided surgery? And I think number one is adherence to guided surgery protocols. Um, every drill guide company has its protocols. And if you vary from the protocols, you compromise the end product. You must understand sources of error and the limitations of the method. This is key. If you don't understand where the error is and what the limitations of the method are, it's going to come back and bite you, and you're going to have a poor experience. So this is not a bulletproof technique. You must understand what's going on and what goes into making a drill guide, and I will talk about that tonight. Um, data acquisition is very important. Again, garbage in, garbage out kind of scenario. Planning, design of the guide, your drill selection is very important, and how you use the guide. So these are the variables that determine success or failure in guided surgery. Guided surgery is not a drill press. So it's not a deal where you just line up your piece of metal underneath the drill bit, close your eyes, pull the handle, drill a hole in steel, and everything's wonderful. That is not, that is, couldn't be further from the truth. There are many sources of error in guided surgery. In CBCT scans, there is error. There was a study done, I think, two years ago where um, investigators looked at five different scanners and they measured the error in the scanners and they found one of the scanners actually had enough error that they recommended it not be used for guided surgery. Um, the quality of the cone beam scan, there's tremendous variability in the quality of scans off the same machine and so again you can't expect a poor quality scan to give you the same outcome in guided surgery as you might get from a sharp scan. Implant planning software, again, these are algorithms. There's potential error there. Data merging, when we merge the patient and model scans, if these are not accurately merged, error. In the virtual plan, there can be error. You can make a mistake doing the virtual plan. I've done it. And you have to be alert to the fact that this can happen, and you have to catch it before you have a poor result. The fit of guides on the teeth, no surprise here. Um, that's been a major issue with printed guides. They rock. They have to be ground to fit. There's error in the fit of all guides on the teeth. Guide height is an issue. The distance from the top of the guide tube to the bone. The fit of drills within drill stops or keys. I'm sure as you all know, that's how you line up the drills within the guide tubes. And there has to be a little bit of play or the drill won't turn. And then you have the fit of the drill stops or the keys within the guide tubes. And again, um, you have to get them in and out, so therefore there has to be a little play. The last one is an interesting one, handedness and surgeon position. And I can't begin to tell you how important this is, and probably many of you may not have verbalized it, but somewhere in your brain you know that this matters. You know that you have a good side and a bad side when you operate. 
and especially when you're doing guided surgery, this is something that you have to think about. Okay, so let's start off with data merging. With data merging, we have a patient scan, we have a model scan. With the protocols that we use at Guided Surgery Solutions, we use little fiducial markers that are little stick-on glass beads. And so the glass beads are present in the patient scan, they're in the model scan, and when we go to merge, the software overlaps the glass beads, and therefore we get a beautiful merge. And I think you can see that if this merge is not accurate, the alignment of the model with the patient's jaw will be off. So the point of a merge is that you have to create, recreate your patient from two parts. And if it's off, you've just introduced error. And you as a guide user would never know it was off. All you would know is that when you drilled into the bone, it wasn't where you thought it should be. And that could be the function of a bad merge. Planning. Again, the plan is only as good as the data. Garbage in, garbage out. So if you scatter obliterating the crest, a fuzzy scan, an inability to view the inferior alveolar nerve, an inadequate impression or model for guide fabrication, um, you are compromising the process. You need an adequate data set. You need to be able to visualize the bone, the gingiva, the teeth, and any error in planning is going to be lead to guide inaccuracy. There's also, when you're doing planning, there's a difficulty in perception of 3D structures in a 2D image, and that's what we're doing um, when we use implant planning software, and it takes a while, it takes quite a while before you get over that and you're able to see things clearly. And there's another thing, planning for implant placement, as we know, it's prosthetically driven. However, there's another level of planning, and that's planning for guided surgery. So that means that you have to have some understanding of what guide tube size you will be placing or wish to use, and not only do you have to position your implant such that it's prosthetically in an ideal position, but also that you can get a guide tube into that position so that a guide can be made. The quality of the scan. Here you have a scan that's pretty clear, but if you can't see the crest, but you can see the buccal and lingual plates, you still can place an implant. It's just that when you go to do the case, you have to visually take a look at the, visually verify the entry point into the crest and your depth. Not the end of the world, but you have to be aware. You can't make a guide and think that depth control will be on the money. So the quality of the scan is very important. You need an adequate data set. You need to be able to have your patient scan and your model scan so when the guide is built on the model that the teeth and the soft tissue are there and the quality of the model is appropriate because the guide is only going to be good as the model. That's what it's built on. Prosthetically driven planning, planning for guided surgery. So here we're using a virtual abutment to center the implant between the teeth. So that's prosthetically driven planning because that abutment is positioned between the two teeth as the tooth would be and that abutment has a certain diameter. However, on that same case, we have to be aware that the guide tubes that we use have different, out, different diameters and it may be necessary to jockey the position of that implant just slightly, a tenth or two millimeter one way or the other, so that the appropriate size guide tube can be placed in the edentulous space. So this is what I meant by planning not only for your prosthetics, but also planning for guided surgery. Drill guide design and flapless surgery. This is a problem that has arisen over the last 20 years in the way guides have been commercialized. If you take a look at these guides, many of these guides are big bulky with flanges that obscure the surgical site. So what we've had, had for the last 20 years is a circumstance whereby the device, the design of a medical device has dictated surgical technique. Because the flange covered surgical site, guided surgery has become synonymous with flapless surgery and nothing could be further from the truth. I can speak from my own experiences and from the many surgeons that we deal with People probably flap 80, 85 percent of their cases. I do flapless surgery, but I pick and choose my cases. And so, as you can see with these guides, um, it's easy to understand by the design of the guides how guided surgery has become 
synonymous with flapless surgery. And I would urge you, if you're new to guided surgery, do not do flapless surgery. You're going to get in trouble. Um, the guides that we manufacture do not have a flange, and you do have ready, ready access to see what you're doing and to reflect your flap. So if one were to look at the characteristics of an ideal drill guide system, I listed these. It does not require adjustment to make it fit. It's stable. It does not rock. It's retentive. It doesn't fall off or loosen easily. It allows visibility of the surgical site. It allows physical access to the surgical site for flap reflection. It allows placement of implants if there is limited vertical clearance. And it allows change in entry point if needed. And so, um, so as we go along here, let's take a look at some of the other issues. A drill guide design. So let's talk about stability and retention. And again, these are things as a guide user you have to pretty much automatically understand and implement because this sets expectations. So again, this is not rocket science. This is something we all know, but we have to apply our knowledge to drill guides. So obviously the retention and stability for tooth supported drill guides is dependent on the number, pattern, and shape of the teeth. You get less retention when the guides are seated on short teeth, conical teeth, or short crown preps. By increasing the surface area, interfacing with the dentulous surfaces like the palate or the ridge, that will increase the stability of your tooth supported guide. So as an example, let's just take a look at this simple little guide. There is a second molar here that the guide is resting on. Well, if that's a robust second molar with a convexity to its contour, we have a shot of that being very stable on that molar. If this is a short molar, conical, or it's a short crown prep, the retention on that molar will be very poor. And so you have to take this into consideration when you're using that guide. Now, if we look at tooth supported drill guides and we rank them for guide stability and retention in decreasing order, this is the order. Obviously, the guide shown here is a tooth supported span, very stable. If it's a maxillary unilateral free end, then that's less stable. Mandibular unilateral free end is even less stable. Maxillary bilateral free end is in the number four slot, and a mandibular bilateral free end is the least stable of the tooth supported guides. The maxillary bilateral free end, at least you have a palate. You don't have it in the mandible, and that will give the guide stability. So again, as you use these guides, you have to look at this information, and you set your expectations for the, ex for the retention and the stability of the guide based upon what it is. So the surgeon's assessment of stability and retention allows for setting expectations and the characteristics of drill guide anchorage determine how and to what extent the drill guide is stabilized by the surgeon or the surgical assistant. So on a guide like this, somebody should have a finger, an elevator on that molar to make sure that guide is seated. On some uh, guides, you can use fixation pins or screws, although I prefer not to. Um, so again, common sense, but you never hear anyone talking about it. And uh, when we speak to guide user, users, um, mistakes are made and, um, you know, guides are uh, used incorrectly with poor results. Now let's talk about a totally different animal, and that is mucosa-supported guides. And the stability of guides for dentulous cases is associated with surface area and indexing. Same as a denture. This is nothing new to us. So your expectations should be adjusted when you're doing these kinds of cases because the potential error is much greater with mucosa-supported drill guides compared with tooth-supported guides. So obviously the maxillary edentulous guide has more surface area, it has a palate, than a mandibular edentulous guide. And some of these mandibular edentulous cases can be majorly challenging if you have minimal surface area and poor index. So a flat ridge, no vestibule, that's a tough case. And you, again, 
you have to use the guide accordingly relative to your assessment of the stability of that guide. So here's an edentulous case that was a very difficult case. As you can see, um, the ridge was very thin. And when we planned the case, we had basically three islands of bone in this patient's jaw. That was it. And we planned the case. And one point I would like to make when doing these kinds of cases is that you want to make sure your implant is placed through the apex of the soft tissue ridge. The most common mistake in doing these kinds of cases is that as surgeons, we want to put it right down the pike. We want to get it right centered in the, in the bone. And in this case, I cheated these implants to the buckle because it's very common, as you probably know, that the apex of the soft tissue ridge in an edentulous mandible is anterior to the hard tissue ridge. And so these implants were positioned accordingly. So a drill guide was placed. These are bleeding points. And I use the bleeding points that indicate the center point for each implant. I use those as a map for making my incisions. So I made my incisions. This is a full thickness flap case, not a dentulous. There's no way on earth I would do this case as a flapless case. Your margin for error is so slim here, and you're drilling also into oblique surfaces, and we'll talk about that in a minute, that I think it would be a total disaster should someone think that a drill guide would help them do this case flapless. So bleeding points, full thickness reflection of flaps, splitting that allows me to see where I am with my attached gingiva relative to the center of the center line of the implant. I did use fixation screws on that guide. Now I, I reapproximated the flaps and then put the drill guide on. And then I drilled through for my pilot holes. And when you do this, the drill goes through the incision without cutting the tissue. The tissue will retract away from the drill. So in this way, it's a full thickness flap. But you approximate the incision, the, approximate the flaps, and then drill through them without having to worry about cutting the tissue. There's a question that came in, if I can interrupt you for a second. Of course, at any point. How do you acquire STL data for full, fully edentulous cases? That was the question posed. OK. There's two ways of doing it. Um, one way would be to use the dual scan method. If the patient is wearing a denture, that's a decent fitting denture that has good extension into the vestibule or into the floor of the mouth, then you can put you can purchase these little glass bead fiducial markers that can be placed on the denture, on the denture flange, and you scan the patient wearing the denture. And you have to be one of the one of the subtleties of the method is you have to be very sure that the denture is seated correctly. So you might have four cotton rolls placed correctly around the uh, the occlusal surface of the denture and have the patient just bite very gently so the denture is seated correctly. Then you would take the denture and scan the denture alone. And those data sets can be merged. And then the guide can be made um, by reverse engineering a model from the underside of the denture. That's one way. The second way would be um, by putting fiducial markers. If you have a, this is a great method if you have a, uh, scanner in your office and this is a protocol that we develop and you can see it on our website but basically you take an alginate tray and you put fiducial markers on the back of the alginate tray you take an impression of your patient's mandible say uh, and leave the impression tray in their mouth put them in the scanner and scan them then you pull the impression tray out pour a stone model leave the model in the impression tray and scan the stone model in the impression tray. And then you get the same kind of data set. And you can build a guide on that, uh, you know, on a replica of that, um, of that model. Again, that's a very brief description. Um, there's a third way of doing it with a scan appliance. But um, all those protocols are on the website. OK, so um, in this particular case, um, I used a tubeless guide. I removed the other guide and put on a tubeless guide. Now, mind you, the pilot holes are started here. But I wanted to verify with my eye 
the entry points and trajectories before I completed these osteotomies. And that's something I recommend as a mainstay of doing guided surgery. Um, you validate your entry point, you validate your trajectory, and you won't get in trouble. And I think when you talk to folks who have used guided surgery in the past and they say, oh, it doesn't work, um, it's a disaster, et cetera, et cetera, there's a lot of bad press about guided surgery. Um, I will bet you significantly that they did not validate their entry points and trajectories. They probably tried to do it flapless. And, um, and of course, it, would be a, it, it could be a disaster in the hands of an inexperienced guided surgery surgeon. So, um, so, we use the, so once I know the entry points are OK, I center the drill in the guide hole in the tubeless guide. Now, the, the tip is fixed in the previous osteotomy, and I complete the osteotomies. So here you can see flaps are partially reflected. This particular, this is just an aside. This implant was placed about four or five millimeters sub-osseous. I put a cover screw on it, and I used it as a depth gauge to do my ridge reduction in this area. It's just one way, you know, people make um, bone reduction guides, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a kind of a nice way. I've done this even on a full arch where um, you put the, you, you determine where your implant has to be. You put the implant subosseous, and then you've got these little depth gauges sitting there, and you just take the bone down to the top of your cover screw. And here are the implants in their final position, primary closure, and again, uh, we had a nice result, but there's attached gingiva on both sides of the um, locators, and the locators are not in the lingual flange of the denture as they would have been if I had done the usual thing, was shooting it right down the center of the uh, bone. Okay, so now let's talk switch gears and talk about vari other variables in the use of drill guides. And I want to talk about the concept of guide height, drill working length, drill selection, V factor, WAG error, short drills, minimal vertical clearance, minimal vertical clearance, and oblique surfaces. Okay, the way we control depth is by providing these custom drill stops. And if you notice, the drill stops have variability in the thickness of the flange. So there's two means of, de of determining, of controlling depth, how depth deep you drill. One is the guide height, which is the distance from the top of this guide tube to the bone, and then the thickness of the flange. And those are the two variables we play with in order to control depth. I want to talk about guide height and working length. And these are concepts that if you're doing guided surgery, you really have to take a couple of minutes to get um, under your belt. Again, guide height is the distance from the top of the guide to the bone or the implant platform. And this is limited by the thickness and contour of the gingiva. If someone has really thick gingiva here and, a lot, and significant bone loss, then the guide height can be you know, more than 10 millimeters. Because if you set the, you want to, we want to set the tube as close to the gingiva as possible, but sometimes there is a, uh, like on the distal of an upper cuspid, as you could guess, some, and so you have a situation where you have an, an upper cuspid, you're missing the bias and the molars, and the mand of the posterior maxilla is resorbed. In those cases, it's very common for there to be a, a large papilla on the distal of the cuspid, and then the bone drops off. And so in that case, you, you're, the bottom of your, your tube can only go as far as the gingiva, and then it drops off, so you could have a significant guide height there. Um, that's a limitation in terms of how we manufacture the guides. There are other ways of approaching it, but what I described is the most common. So that's guide height. Okay. The other thing you want to understand is your drill working length. Again, as I said, you can use your own drills if they're long enough. And hub drills are the devil when it comes to making drill stops. Straight drills are really nice. So. The working length would be the distance from the underside of the flange to the tip of the drill. So when this goes into the guide tube, everything bottoms out when the flange hits the face of your drill, and this seats on the top of the drill guide. That's as far as it goes. So that would be your drill working length. So then you can calculate how deep an osteotomy can I prepare with a drill of a given length. So in this example, 22 and a half millimeter working length. 10 millimeter guide height, do the math, that means this thing is going to drill 12 and a half millimeters. 
And that's something you have to be aware of as you design your cases. There's a question that came in. How yep. do you consider the influence of sloped bone surfaces and possible deviation of drills? That uh, We're going to cover that in a minute um, in terms of I have a little thing here on drilling into oblique surfaces, which I think will cover that. And if it doesn't, then if you could pipe up with that one again. Okay. Um, okay, so again, I don't mean to beat this to death, but it's really, really important for you to understand. Um, so let's talk more about drill length and guided surgery. Guide heights are commonly 10 millimeters. That's a com they can be 8, they can be 9, they can be 12, but commonly around 10. Your handpiece, you, if you take a look at the total length of your drill here, your handpiece is going to take up about 13 millimeters of your total drill length. Your handpiece is going to add 3 millimeters to your total drill length. If you, if you go from here to here, it's going to be the length of the drill, as you see here, plus 3 millimeters. Ballpark. It varies from handpiece to handpiece. Most of the implant drills out there are anywhere from 32 to 37 millimeters long. And as I mentioned, drills with hubs interfere with the manufacture of drill stops and can make the drill functionally shorter than it actually is. So let's just run through some examples, some, some ranges of drills. Some of the shorter drills that come with, for implants would be 32 millimeters of, of length. Okay, so if you have a 32 millimeter long drill, subtract the 13 that gets taken up into the handpiece, you now have a working length of 17. If your guide height is 10, this is as deep as you go. You're not going any deeper than 9 millimeters. That's it. So that's a major limitation of a short drill. Now you can get around that by putting it into a drill extension, which we often do. But again, you have to be able to run the math to understand what's going on. A common 36 millimeter drill with a working length of 23, guide height of 10, you're going to be able to get a 13 millimeter osteotomy. And for immediate implants, it's really important to have a long drill because you don't strike bone for quite a ways. And so you need a drill that'll get into the socket and hit that oblique surface of bone. And as it turns out, Blue Sky Bio makes a really nice 41 millimeter drill that gives you a 28 millimeter working length. So with a guide height of 7, 10, you get a working osteotomy depth of, you can drill down 17 millimeters, which is really, really nice. You know, the limitations, again, there's a catch-22 here, okay? And that is, the shorter the drill, the easier it is used in the, in the first and second molar areas. However, you run the risk of drilling short. The longer the drill, you're not going to drill short in the posteriors, but will you be able to fit it back there? So you've got to understand these things and, um, and work with different, you know, understand what you're getting into before you do it, I guess. I think the common scenario is, is that the surgeon has a case, flaps the case, puts the guide in, and then discovers that the drills just aren't working for him in that case. Another thing I strongly recommend at your consultations with implant patients is measure their opening, measure their maximum and sizal opening. I do it with my fingers. So if somebody opens three fingers, fantastic. They open two fingers, I start looking for my short drills. The other thing I will do is I keep a, a, an old drill contra angle in my drawer with a drill in it. We put them in plastic sleeves. And when that patient who opens two fingers walks in the door and sits in my chair, at some point I take the drill out and I see if I can fit it in the back of the person's mouth. And sometimes I tell them, look it, the only way I'm getting this in is if the Curva Wilson cooperates with us and you know so if the mandible has a really nice lingual tilt that means I'll be able to get into the palate a little bit or if the maxilla has a buccal flare maybe I'll get into the vestibule a little bit with my drill and so um, again these are the little nuances that people don't talk about but make or break the success of use of doing guided surgery we did a survey um, of 12,000 implant surgeons several years ago. We found that 18% of guides were thrown out. Um, and these were guides that were paid for. And the reason was is they didn't have enough per vertical clearance in the posterior to use the guides. And all I'm saying to you is that's something you can learn at the consultation appointment and that's something you want to pay attention to. So again, drill working length is an important concept 
and you have to have available to yourself drills of different lengths so that you can manage the different situations that you're going to walk into. Okay, depth control and drill stop flange, I think we spoke about that. Again, the variable would be the thickness of the flange and how high the guide tube is off of the gingiva. Those are the two variables that determine, that allow us to control depth. The V factor. Um, for many systems, the drilling depth actually is 0.5 to 1.5 millimeters more than the length of the corresponding implant. So in this particular drill, the drilling depth is 12 and a half millimeters for a 11 and a half millimeter implant. So this is obviously something you want to understand. It comes into how deep the osteotomies are in your plan that you submit for um, guides. And also it's a critical thing um, if you think about if you're dancing near the IAN or the sinus, um, this is something you really want to know. Because that little laser mark on the drill that says, you know, okay, it's for 11 and a half millimeter implant, that really could be drilling 12 and a half millimeters. Okay. Talk about error in guided surgery. The fit of the drill stop in the guide tube and the fit of the drill inside the drill stop. And this contributes to something we call the wag, the wag error, error, like a dog's tail. The drill is in here, and I can move that drill probably a millimeter in either direction. And the further, the greater the distance between the top of the guide and the tip of the drill, the greater the wag. So if, if the tip of the drill were here, the wag would be a fraction of what it is down here. So, and it's due to the radial movement of the drill tip, due to the need for movement of the drill stop within the guide tube and movement of the drill within the drill stop. The amount of wag is correlated with guide height. It also can be due to the difficulty of placing the drill neutrally in the drill stop due to the leverage exerted by length and weight of the handpiece in the cord. And this is where handedness and implant position play a role. So you want to just be really careful that you're comfortable, your arm is in a good position, your hand's in a good position, and that you're neutral going into that drill stop and that guide tube. And again, these are the little things that can make or break a case. And you have to be aware that there is a wag error. We got a note from a, a dentist who wasn't happy with a guide. He said that when you put your drill through a guide tube, it should not move at all. And he clearly didn't understand some of the principles involved in building these things. So one of the ways to minimize the wag error is that when you place your pilot drill in the drill stop, you just very gently pump it up and down vertically so the rotational movement centers the drill within the drill stop and then tap the bone repeatedly, just lightly, press light pressure, light pressure, till you start your osteotomy. Because if you were to use heavy pressure, then the leverage and handedness and all that stuff plays a role and can then cause you to have a wag error. And if you want to check on it, you can create a little one millimeter deep osteotomy and take the drill out, put a two millimeter guide pin into the two millimeter drill stop and just let it drop in. And if it, because you know it's passive, it's not being affected by leverage or handedness. And if it drops into the pilot hole, you know you've just confirmed that the osteotomy is accurate. These kinds of things don't take very much time. And I'm a belt and suspenders person times three. And I don't mind spending an extra few minutes validating and verifying as I go along. Because in the end, I don't have disasters. And I'm very pleased with the consistency the consistent results that a drill guide delivers. One of the issues people can have is interference with a long tooth. Okay, so here's a tall cuspid, a lot of resorption, and when you put your drill in, you just can't reach. Okay, the obvious solution is a drill extension. So don't be timid in using getting out your drill extension and, and using it. Hang on. Okay. Okay, so that's the long tooth interference. Okay. I'm going to talk now about the modified entry point protocol. Here's another issue that you can run into in guided surgery, not commonly, but sometimes. And that is um, what happens if the entry point's in the wrong location? Then you can't use your tube guide. 
But if you have a tubeless guide, you can change the entry point and still do guided surgery. So here's a case where we made a, uh, an osteotomy. And here's the osteotomy, but it was a little, when I looked at it, it was too lingual. So I moved it to the buckle. And then I put in a tubeless guide. Now with a tubeless guide, you're fixed at the occlusal surface on the incisal edge here, but the tip of the drill can wag anywhere you want it. So I take the tip of the drill, put it into the new osteotomy, and drill down. And I'm guided. The only limitation to this method is in your mind's eye and looking at a cross section, you have to be aware that when you choose the new trajectory, that there's enough bone width that you know where the apex of that implant is going to be okay. And then, of course, we use these guides to um, guide the implant delivery as well, the tubeless guides and the endpoint. Okay, now let's talk about limitations of guided surgery. This is where cases, this is where error can really get you. Crestal bone poorly visualized, the entry point and the depth have to be verified visually. You have a thin ridge or a tight space. You must flap and verify visually and use check films like lower incisors, maxillary incisors. We've had people call and order drill guides because they had to do an implant in a very tight um, lateral, upper lateral incisor site. And their thought was that, wow, I have to be really precise and therefore a drill guide is what I need. And they don't understand that you still have to flap and verify because you're, if you're off a half a millimeter, you're done. You could be into a tooth. And so, again, the guide is tremendously helpful for you to, to replicate um, a position with subsequent drills, but you have to check and double check these cases. If you have a knife edge or an oblique ridge, you have to flap and verify. If you have inadequate vertical clearance, we have a protocol. An edentulous guys with a flat ridge, minimal vestibule, those are cases you have to be very careful and verify and validate at many steps. Flapless surgery is contraindicated in all of the above cases. There's no way on earth are you going to have a successful case doing it, doing any of the above cases flapless. Okay, now drilling to an oblique surface, um, a knife edge ridge, and this is, you know, or an immediate implant. Those are two examples. So what's going to happen is when you drill into an oblique surface such as this, the lingual aspect of an upper central incisor socket, what's going to happen, maybe, is that the surface, the oblique surface, will push the drill buccally and apically. And that's the error that occurs in this location. And the solution when you're doing, and this will happen with a guide, even with a guide in, because the wag factor is, look where you are, you're not up here. You know, you just, if this is 10 millimeters, this is 15 millimeters or more, you are way up there. And so the wag can be very considerable. So what you must do is you use a very sharp drill, high speed, and advance really slowly. So you place it in, you get comfortable, you go up and down in the guide tube to let the rotation self-center the drill in the guide tube, in the drill stop. And then you tap the bone and you tap the bone and tap the bone ever so lightly so that your progression into the bone is more than the force driving you to the buckle. And once you get in and you have your entry point validated, and then you can drill further and you're in business. But go slowly. You want to get that initial two millimeter pilot hole in exactly the right spot. And that's the method by which one would do it. And again, if this were a knife edge or any oblique surface, the principle is the same. Here's an example of an upper central incisor case. Um, fractured tooth and again this is how the tooth grows this is this is another case but a case we, uh, 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 that we got um, where the surgeon actually put in the implant in the same way that the tooth grew it was a disaster obviously we had to take this implant out but um, you don't want to do that <laughs> yeah uh, so that's the trajectory and in this case the tooth was extracted just as an aside I sometimes will prep a tooth before I extract it, if there's, a, if there's a possibility that the beak of the forcep will pinch or damage the tissue, because it's really critical to keep the soft tissue. Here you can see also that the osteotomy was on the mesiolingual. It doesn't necessarily follow. This tooth was close, I think, to the lateral, and I had to move the apex over so I wouldn't be hitting the lateral when the implant was placed. And the implant's placed, and you can see how close to it. If I had gone in the same way as the socket, 
I would have, here it is here. I would have been in trouble here. I had to move it over to the mesial sum. But so that's how those kinds of cases are done. And here's the final restoration on that case. Okay, another problem area that you can run into. And again, we talked about measuring maximum incisal opening with your fingers. Um, trying in the uh, the handpiece to make sure before you you know you do the case to make sure you have room for the handpiece. Well, in these cases where there is minimal vertical clearance, it's very difficult to stack the drill above the guide tube. What happens is the back of the handpiece is on the opposing tooth and that pressures the handpiece. You can dislodge a drill guide and not know it. You can have a monster wag error and obviously you can cause an implant positional error. We developed a protocol using a tubeless guide and a combination of long and short drills um, that allows us to do guided surgery in second molar sites where you can't use a conventional tube guide. And this is done in this way. So here, you know, using a tube guide requires a stacking of the drill above the tube. And sometimes you don't appreciate this until the surgical appointment. Okay, and then what do you do? So using our method, basically, we use the tube guide with a file and a drill stop, and we create a bleeding point. We then insert, then we place the tubeless guide, and we insert a drill at an angle, and then stand it up. And this method works if you can't use a tube guide, but you can get your equipment in there freehand. This works. And so you insert the drill at an angle, stand it up, put the tip into the hole, into the bleeding point, and you drill down. Now you created a pilot hole. And now with your drill stop on, you can drill to depth. So now we have a guided osteotomy in exactly the right spot by a different method. So two points make a straight line. And so in this case, it's a bleeding point, and it's a guide hole at the top of this tubeless guide that create your trajectory. Here's a case where we made a bleeding point, placed the pilot, the, the created a pilot hole through the gingiva, flapped it, put the drill in at an angle, put the tip in there, drill down. Next drill, same thing. Angle, straighten it up, drill down. And so now we're doing guided surgery. And some of these second molar sites, you don't have a visual perspective. And it's very hard without a guide to know where you are because they're so deep and so far back. And with this method, you can do guided surgery in situations you can't use a tube guide. And here are the osteotomies. The tubeless guide is also used to center the countersink, center the tap, and I always use it to place the implant. You can guide your implant placements. And uh, this is the end. These are the placements at the end, the final result. Okay, I wanted to go through this. Drill guides cannot be made. If the scan has poor image quality, if the data from the bone scan and the model scan cannot be merged due to scatter or poor image quality, if the digital or physical impressions do not capture the relevant anatomy, and if the stone models are of poor quality, broken, or have voids, you cannot make a drill guide. So in terms of setting expectations, this is where we started this talk. What is guided surgery? I think that's pretty clear. Is guided surgery bulletproof? Absolutely not. Is there error in guided surgery? Yes, there is. And you have to know when the error can bite you and when you can manage the error. Um, as an example, a fatty lower molar site, if you're off a half a millimeter or even a millimeter, I'm not happy to be off, but it's not going to be the end of the world. In an upper lateral incisor site that's tight, you're off a half a millimeter, you could be into a tooth root. So again, those are two very, it's guided surgery in both cases, but they're totally different animals. And you have to be aware of, you know, in one case the wag error may not get you, but in an upper lateral incisor site, you betcha it will. And that's a case where you have to validate and verify your entry point, your trajectory, and you have to take check films. Whereas on a molar site, I can't remember the last time I took a check film on a molar site using guides. Are all guides created equal? I hope everyone appreciates that not. 
The major separation is between the mucosa supported guides and the tooth borne guides. Two different animals. And within those categories, there are multiple, multiple kinds of guides relative to their stability and their retention. Is guided surgery flapless surgery? Absolutely not. I, I just hope we can bury that one because that has caused more people, more misery. Um, reflecting a flap, what's the big deal? It takes like three minutes. But it gives you the opportunity to validate and verify your entry points, and that is the key, that is the key to successful surgery. Is guided surgery a method that enables inexperienced surgeons to do implant surgery? Absolutely not. If you think that if you get a guide, you can skip all the preliminary steps that make you a surgeon, you're, you're going to have bad experiences. Because it's not guided surgery versus freehand surgery. Guided surgery is an extension of freehand surgery. And all of the things that we've learned in freehand surgery, you have to be able to learn how to employ those within the framework of guided surgery. And lastly, is there a learning curve to becoming a competent guided surgery surgeon? Absolutely, and as you can see, it's a pretty significant learning curve. It's infinite. I mean, knowing how to plan, uh, understanding the, uh, getting used to 3D imagery shown to you in two dimensions, there is a lot to do in guided surgery. And so, and it's, from my point of view, it's really fun. It makes implant dentistry exciting and fun. It also decreases my stress. When I go into a case, there's not much I don't know about that osteotomy and that patient's anatomy. Um, and the surgeries are fun. I'm not saying every surgery is fun, but many of the, most of the surgeries are fun because I personally get a big kick out of planning something theoretically and then being able to execute it and seeing a really wonderful outcome. To me, that's very satisfying. I'd like to leave you with this slide. And these are the guiding principles of guided surgery. One is using a drill guide is not like using a drill press to create a hole in steel. And like other methods, guided surgery has limitations, error, and nuances which must be managed. All drill guides are not created equal. Guided surgery is not a substitute for surgical judgment and experience. Do not leave your brain at the door when you're using a drill guide. This is a phenomenon that has happened to me. I have a drill guide, I start using it, and all of a sudden my brain turns off and I'm just drilling through the guide without thinking about it. Big mistake, <laughs> because you, you, you just leave yourself open to not picking up an error when you might have picked up an error. Guided surgery is not flapless surgery. I pick and choose my flapless cases. I've done zillions of them. It's fun to do, but raising a flap takes two minutes. Guided surgery is not flapless surgery. Guided surgery is a technique with a learning curve. And finally, verify your entry point and trajectory before completing your osteotomy. I mean, if I do 100 cases and I have two disasters, that's a nightmare. So for me to spend an extra 30 seconds or 45 seconds verifying entry points and trajectories before completing osteotomies, the cost-benefit analysis is fantastic, and this is what I would recommend for you. Thank you very much. Be happy to entertain any questions. Okay, if there are any questions, please enter them into the QA box on the right of the screen. There was a comment that came in earlier saying, I would add that with oblique or sloped bone surfaces, the use of a big diameter drill in the beginning can countersink the initial osteotomy and help the centering of small diameter drills. That's true. Basically what you're doing is you're creating, you're flattening out, you're, you're creating, you're getting rid of the oblique and you're um, almost flattening the surface that your small drill goes into. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. Although the, the, the danger of it is, is that um, if the drill diameter is too big, um, you may have created a little bit of a wider uh, cutout than you wanted. Okay. Do you want to bring up your contact details on the screen? Um, yeah, I didn't put. I didn't. I did not. Uh, I did not prepare contact details. I can tell you, it's um, Maybe my website. my uh, it, the website is guided guided surgery solutions dot com, and um, my email is. Jerry 
at guidedsurgerysolutions.com. Jerry at guidedsurgerysolutions at gmail. Okay. I'd also like to remind everybody to enter your details into the attendance form so that we can send you the CE credit. There are links to the attendance form in the comments section under the video windows. Uh, Dr. Haber, I'd like to thank you very much for tonight's webinar presentation. And I'd like to thank everybody who attended. Um, the, there should be a recording of the presentation available on YouTube very shortly after the presentation is over. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. And thank you all who attended. Good night.